I'd like to uh, welcome Rodolphe Dutel, who is the head of operation at the well-known remote company, Buffer. And he's also the founder of Remotive.io. Uh, people have been talking to it already about it um, already in the chat. Uh, Remotive is a newsletter on remote work and um, it, sends every it sends every two weeks a newsletter about remote work tips and jobs and there's over 20,000 subscribers now, right now. So um, I would like to bring Rodolphe on screen. Bring him on screen and then unmute you. Hi Hello. Rodolphe. Hi Daphne, how are you? Good, very good. Um, so um, before we start, I just want to tell everybody you can uh, already start asking questions while uh, Hadolf is talking and then at the end of the session we will ask Hadolf questions from the Q&A, so same system as before. So uh, you can go ahead and Hadolf, I'll give you the mic and I'm going to share your screen and hide myself. I hope you're going to have an amazing talk. Thanks Daphne, it's great to be here. Hi everyone. Um, I had a great time looking, watching Jennifer's session and learning more about TopTal. And I'm excited to continue this chat. And I'd like to thank uh, the entire team for making this conference possible. My name is Rodolphe and I, I'm dialing in from Paris today, Paris, France. I'm excited to tell you about uh, productivity and about disconnecting today. So, so those two topics, uh, disconnecting and productivity, they might seem a little bit opposed and for remote workers for people that works outside of offices it's actually a pretty big topic because when you think of it when you work in an office you start going to the office at 9 a.m and then you wrap up your day around 5 p.m quite typical for us working remotely it's quite different it's harder to know when your day is going to start and sometimes it's also harder to know when your day is going to stop so i want to tell you a little bit more about Buffer story as a company, then I'll tell you about how to disconnect. Uh, I've been doing some experiences, my, experiments myself, so I'll share that with you all. And at the end, uh, I'll be sharing with you seven different tips and tools that I use to be more productive every day. So there you have it. I'll tell you about Buffer as a company. I'll tell you about disconnecting. And at the end, I'll tell you about productivity. So let's dive in. Um, for starters, I work at Buffer as director of operation. So my job is to help about 80 people in total to be more productive in what they do and to achieve more, to get organized and work remotely. To, a little bit like Jets. Um, on the side, as Daphne mentioned, I run a website called remotive.io, which is a newsletter, a community, and a job board if you want to find a job online. So the company I work for is called Buffer.com. Uh, it was established in 2011 by an Austrian person named Leo and an Englishman named Joel. And those two flew to the US, to San Francisco, to make this sort of happen. So from day one, we already had a remote element to our DNA. Um, what we do as a company is helping people save time managing social media. And we've really been trying to think about not only what we do as a business, which is assess, assisting 4 million people to share content on social media, but also how we do it. How do we do business? What's, what's an enjoyable way to do business? And as a consequence, we started to be driven by value and do a variety of things. I guess for this talk, the most notable feature of Buffer is that we have no offices. Uh, we headquarter in San Francisco and somewhere in San Francisco, I'm not exactly sure where, there's a PO box where our physical mail is being sent through. Uh, aside from that, we have no typical office. You get to work from the place that makes you the happiest. So no need to be in a place in particular. As a consequence, we've been thinking about how to operate a remote team for quite some time. And we've been trying to get the team to do the best work we can together. Meet the team, by the way. Here is everyone. Uh, we are 80 people spread out across 11 different time zones. Um, it was so hard to try to think about who's working right now, who's awake, who's asleep, that my friend, uh, my friend Dan created a website called timezone.io where we can see little faces of people everywhere and who's working right now, who's sleeping right now. Uh, we range from the West Coast all the way to Australia. So that, that's quite a few of us. And I've been lucky enough to join this adventure two and a half years ago, it was in 2014. 
uh, you can see my smiling face here on the bottom left corner. And it was a very surreal experience for me for two reasons. First, because I'd been working with the company for three months when I first met everyone in the same room, uh, which was quite an experience. I'd worked with all those people without meeting them in person just yet. The second part was that as important as it is to work remotely, it's also super important to get to see people face to face. And going into a company-wide retreat is a buffer tradition that we've been keeping up since uh, 2011, I believe. So fast forwarding to this year, here's a picture of a very large group in 2016. We kept meeting up at least once a year. On this picture, you can see buffer people, so people working at buffer, you can also see significant others, uh, kids and uh, family members. So not only did we fly people to Hawaii to get to work together, but we also decided that for those nine days we spent together as a team to build report, we'll also invite people that are close to us to get to know the real us a little bit better. And one of the things we realized is we really had two different approach to this remote work that we could see. We found that we had remote workers and nomads. Uh, so what's the difference between those two groups? People that are remote workers, essentially they work from home or from coffee shop or co-working spaces, and sometimes they travel. Whereas people that are nomads, they are on the road at all time. And both is absolutely great because the theme that we have is how do you get to exercise your freedom, whether you work from home, whether you travel a lot, how do you get to organize yourself? And I want to share with you two different stories from two different people that are embracing the opportunity to be at Buffer, to organize themselves very differently than most people. So first I'd like you to meet Roy. Uh, <laughs> Roy has decided that starting his work day at 5 a.m. is one of the best decisions he's made all year. Um, works, Roy works as a product researcher. He lives in Canada and he has three kids. And what he's doing uh, most, of, most days is waking up at 5 a.m., working away, and then he has more time to spend around 1 p.m. with his uh, wife and with, with his kids as well. Uh, as a consequence, he goes to bed about 9 p.m. So that's a new way to organize yourself with teammates all around the world, with customers all around the world. Gives you freedom to experiment with what you want to do. And that's a great illustration for me of someone embracing flexibility to be either 100% on when he feels comfortable or 100% off when he wants to have family time or me time, for instance. Another illustration we have on the nomad side of thing is my friend Matt. So Matt works as a data analyst buffer and is an American. Earlier this year, he's decided to sell his house and possessions in order to be on the road. He purchased an RV and now he's touring the US many national parks together with his wife and their dogs, and he can work from anywhere he wants. So Matt took it to another extreme in the sense that we have a, buff, uh, a value add buffer that is living smarter, not harder. And I find it's a very interesting perspective to put things. And if you look at Matt, he's got a antenna installed in his RV. He's got cell phone connection. He can go to town. So he can literally work from wherever he wants. And the interesting thing is that when you consider both, both uh, Roy and now Matt, whether you're a remote worker or a nomad, it's still tricky to get things done. You see those two little characters, uh, those come from the blog from Headspace that I really, really enjoy. We all aspire to be this very calm person that has no worries in the world and that is very, very settled. But oftentimes, we fall into the left-hand side picture, which is we're juggling with several different things at all time. Especially as remote workers, especially at nomads, not only do we have to handle work, but life gets in the way too. Because unlike people working in an office, we don't have this physical boundary of stepping in and out in an office environment. We have to organize ourselves and we have to motivate ourselves. Besides, we are under siege with distraction. We're distracted. Does this feel familiar? 
it's a picture I took from the Trello blog and Trello certainly knows a thing or two about getting put to be productive and organized. Um, you got Instagram notification, you have emails, you have WhatsApp, you have Slack on your phone. You even have a 25% battery, uh, which is a little bit stressful to me. So you very much solicited at all time. Uh, McKinsey's study showed that on average, we spend two hours per day doing email. I don't know how many hours we spend on Slack, but it's very significant as well. So beyond being a remote worker, organizing ourselves is a real challenge. And we're so distracted that if you look at the, the one item that really defines our generation or modern age, the smartphone, we're looking at our smartphone on average 110 times per day, which is uh, very tricky to get anything done in our own time. It's really hard to focus these days. So as an extension of that, I've started to wonder, if you want to get a lot done with your day, how can you explore the opposite, which is how can you disconnect often and efficiently, meaning how can you leave work to work and disconnect to enjoy what you want to do on the side? Because otherwise, you're always on. It is, in my opinion, not a very healthy thing to do. So how can you be 100% off? How can you disconnect? I'd love to share four different examples from my own experience on how to disconnect every day, then once a week, when you're on vacation, and just like long, long term as well. So here it is. The first tip is so simple. It feels very intuitive, but very few people do it. Uh, it's your airplane mode on your phone. I call it the nine to nine rule. So nine to nine is simple. At 9 p.m., I'm gonna put my phone in airplane mode and I'm not gonna switch it back on until 9 a.m. on the following day. And the goal here is to really try to restore my sleep, really try to do this small thing that helps me disconnect. Because I was looking up studies from the National Sleep Foundation and it feels like right now, the, the sleep that we're getting is decreasing every year for the last 50 years on average. So we sleep a lot less, often due to technology. Another tricky fact is that 90% of Americans use a gadget at least an hour before bed, at least a few times a week. Meaning that when you fall asleep, oftentimes you have your phone by your bedside table, and it's likely that the quality of your sleep may be disturbed by notification, or by other information. So a very simple tip for disconnecting every day as a remote worker is just giving the airplay mode some more love there. The other thing I find super helpful is journaling. Once a week, at the end of the week, I will sit down and I will write my thought down on paper, on the Moleskine, because I want to physically download my thoughts from my brain down to paper. Whether those are stresses, challenges or opportunities, I find it very liberating to have everything done on paper so it doesn't linger in a part of my brain anymore. I feel like it's uh, like closing a chapter, just like a book and opening a new one then. As an extension, it also allows you to be deep into an activity that is not simply um, keyboard and computer. Um, it's often interesting to see how we spend our time and whether you can have a creative outlet in what you do. So here's an example. When you have downtime, are you more prone to go towards Netflix and watching videos on YouTube or to disconnect and to try to do things that are completely unrelated and gets you into that creative state, such as uh, coloring books, cooking, playing instruments, and uh, writing or drawing, for instance. I really encourage all of you to try to find your favorite creative outlet so that you build this routine of creating something that is completely analog and not digital at all. So you have another outlet to express yourself. Um, here's a fun one as well when you go on vacation. This is a, a fancy hotel. This is called Villa Stephanie. It's in Baden-Baden in Germany. And I found this on a Financial Time article. In this hotel, they are so serious about helping you to disconnect on vacation that they have what we call a silver switch. And if you switch it on, 
is going to be blocking up to 96% of all Wi-Fi signal. They went as far as to put special wall co coating to, to block uh, network signal in the hotel, which I find very crazy. Um, so just so you know, to go on vacation there costs you about $1,000 per night. So if you can't quite find afford it, uh, you can go camping, which is absolutely great. Or pro tip, next time you go into a city out, uh, escapade on Airbnb, for instance, you can pick and select uh, to go to an apartment that does not have Wi-Fi on Airbnb so that uh, you'll feel a little more refreshed by not having internet. My last tip about disconnecting is a little bit extreme and it comes from personal experience. So this is me here on the picture. Uh, and this picture was taken 2,000 nautical miles from the closest shore and about with about 20,000 feet of water beneath myself. Um, this picture was taken during a transatlantic trip, uh, a sailing trip that I did in 2015. Uh, that was very, very interesting. So for an entire month, for four weeks, I was fully disconnected. I was on a very small sailboat with another three people. And as a crew of four, we joined um, Canary Island in Europe, all the way to the Canary, to the Caribbean. So it was a little bit extreme, but it was a lot of fun. Meaning, in other words, how can you think about what you're doing with your life if you still have a constant flow of information coming towards yourself? This was a, a very interesting attempt to disconnect from everything. And the only incoming information I will have is a weather forecast about what was happening. And it was quite an eventful, eventful adventure. Um, I've done it twice now, uh, one in 2013, once in 2015. On the picture, you can see my friend Arthur uh, holding the GoPro, and I'm on the back uh, steering the boat with a, a slightly worried look on my face here. Um, and that's a very extreme way to disconnect, but I'd love to bring this in to help you think about a, a specific thing, which is when was the last time that you managed to step away from your computer and from your phone? for maybe not a month, but say one week or even one weekend. In other words, could you make it a challenge for yourself to spend an entire 48 hours, Friday to Monday, for instance, without touching your phone and technology in order to refresh your energy and to get different perspective on what you do? So those are mostly my thoughts around disconnecting. That's um, hopefully bringing some uh, thoughts on, on how to get about it and how to be sure that you either a hundred percent off or a hundred percent on. And I've talked a lot about non-working in this talk so far. So now I want to go back to the work environment and I want to talk about the hundred percent on, meaning what tools can you use to be productive as a remote worker? So I thought about it for quite some time and I've been lucky to try several tools uh, to try tons of tips. And this time around, I've picked seven different tools and tips that I think are very, very helpful. Um, and I've picked it for several reasons. I think that productivity is not about how you manage your time. That's only a component. It's about how you manage your energy. And when I think about energy, I'm talking about your mental energy and your presence and your physical action of working. So, I'm going to go into details in all seven tips and you'll see what, I, what, I'm, what I'm talking about here. So the first tip is be kind to your eyes. If you work on a computer a lot like myself, chances are you're staring into a light bulb with your bare eyes. If you use this free software, just get Flux or Flux, it's going to be dimming your screen according to what time of the day it is outside. So if it's nighttime outside, your screen is going to be a little bit warmer so that you don't damage your eye looking at a computer screen that is too bright for you. Um, in my, it may sound trivial, but if you work for 10 hours a day on a computer, it does make a big difference. The second tip is be kind to your back. Ergonomics is a huge topic. What you're seeing in the picture is called the roost stand. 
and it's the easiest laptop stand and the most flexible laptop stand. I actually have it here. I'm not commissioned, I just really like it. Um, it's the easiest laptop stand to, to travel, to be on the road with. This is my actual setup. I use those accessories to work. Uh, if you think about working in technology for the next 40 to 50 years, because you really like it, the best time to think about your back pain and your posture is today. Uh, some of us are very lucky to have stand-up desks or ergonomic bowls. If you don't have it, I really advise you start thinking and investing in your setup because your back will thank you later. I'm certainly very happy to have accessories making my posture a little bit better here. The third tip is be kind to your memory. Um, I use 1Password as a software. And what this does for me is to store tons of passwords. Actually wrote it down. I'm storing 229 passwords, credit cards, identity on my computer that can access with one single secret password. So I truly do not want to try to remember passwords or specific logins or the email address I get to that one website. So I just don't. When it comes to logging in or credit card, I trust one password. When I take notes on specific documents, I use Evernote to try to remember most things. That has been very successful for me and, and it's, it's quite reasonably priced as well. Wow, fourth tip is one of my favorites. It's about managing your attention. Be kind to your attention. Uh, Adblock is a free software. It works on Chrome. What it does for you is that it's block commercials and, and advertising that you haven't asked to watch. So I've just run the numbers for myself and it's blocking on average 400, 400 ads per day. So this is huge, meaning that I don't spend my cognitive capacity watching ads, I only access the content I want. I really encourage you to check it out. Uh, I find that it makes a huge difference in how I approach internet overall. The fifth tip is be kind to your focus. Um, if you're like me and surrounded by interesting remote workers, chances are people are gonna send you blogs, they're gonna send you articles, they're gonna send you videos to read or watch. And I love browsing through content. I'm extremely excited to get new content every time. But if you send a link and I click straight away and start reading, I'm gonna lose my focus overall. So anytime anyone's gonna send me something, I'm gonna bookmark it with pocket.com and then I'm gonna access it later on. So it's just like filling a virtual fridge with a lot of uh, article as in food that I can access later on in my own time. Because otherwise, if you send cool thing to me and I work on a project, I'm gonna have FOMO, fear of missing out, but I only want to access it later. So get pocket is absolutely vital in my day too. Uh, it allows me to stay focused on what I do, but not miss out on the cool information I get. Tip number six, be kind to your productivity. I love the Pomodoro technique, which is a method to do time boxing. What that means is, since we interrupt it at all times, I train myself to work in 25 minute increments. And then after a 25 minute increment, I take a five minute break where I just walk around, I stretch, I take time for myself uh, to take a break. And what it allows me to do is that when I have something to do, like writing this speech, for instance, I can budget how much time I'm gonna spend. I can say, I'm gonna be spending four, five, six Pomodoro techniques, four, five, six times 25 minutes on this. So I don't ask myself, huge commitment as in you need to be focused for two hours because I know I won't manage it. And I also know how much time I will budget for each time and each task. That feels pretty good to me. I saved my favorite tip for the, for the last part, but it's, I cannot recommend it enough. The last tip is be kind to your mind. And I use a, self to, uh, a service called headspace.com. You can have it on your phone. You can have it on your computer. And this is a meditation app. When I wake up in the morning, I usually take a shower, 
meditate and then grab some breakfast. This is huge for me. When I wake up in the morning, I'm so excited to be working my projects that after time, it's, I'm very unclear with what to start. I'm so excited. I'm getting emails, notification, and a lot of stimulants. Taking 10, 15, or 20 minutes even to relax, meditate, and start my day makes a huge difference to what I do. Because truthfully, you can use any gear you want, any software you want, any uh, hardware you want. If your heart and your head is not in the right place when you start and you finish your day, then it's not going to be a great day. So I really think that self-care for remote workers is not something we talk about nearly enough. You should, if you can, treat your head right, treat your body right with exercise and ergonomics, and then and only then use all the software and all the tricks to get more done with time. So those are the seven tricks and tips that I wanted to share with you today. If you want to learn more about those tips and tricks, I encourage you to check out remotive.io, which is my website, where you can get my newsletter that I sent to 20,000 people. And you can also join our community, uh, 400 people that are all remote workers are meeting in our community to talk about gear, talk about productivity, exchange thoughts, and also especially to find jobs. So we also run a job board where you can learn more about what companies may be happy to have you join them as a remote worker. So that feels like a great way to get started. Also, you can visit uh, buffer.com. Any example I mentioned is publicly available on open.buffer.com, which is our public blog where we share and explain everything we do. We're all about sharing, all about the community. So if you have a question, I will take them in the chat, or you can email me or tweet at me, and uh, you can visit any of those websites as well. So before we go into the Q&A part, uh, the message I want to leave you with today is, since we're all excited about being productive, we're all excited about technology, the next frontier for me is how can you train yourself to be either 100% on at work or 100% off in your own time? Because it's, if you're working remotely, often time it's going to be mixed and it's creating a lot of empathy towards yourself and towards what you're doing to find the right balance for yourself. So I challenge you to try to think about disconnecting more often, to try and think about closing laptops, disconnecting, and be as productive as you can during your work time and as offline as you can during your own time. That's it for me. Thank you very much. This is the time for Q&A now. Thank you so much, Rodolf. It's, uh, I'm going to put back my camera so I can come back here, but really great advice. Thank you very much for, for sharing. And um, I'm going to myself note a lot of what you've been sharing today. I actually felt very productive with the first tips. I was like, wow, I actually do this myself. I must be a very productive person. <laughs> so like there are some, <laughs> some, some tools that I, I, I really like myself and I discovered new tools as well in those that you've been sharing. So it's pretty nice. I think everybody really liked and um, enjoy your, your talk today. I'm gonna go ahead and jump in questions so we can spend about 10 minutes or 10 to 12 minutes for questions. So uh, I have a first question from Louis-Éric Simard. Uh, his question is, how do you balance the need to sync versus efficiently deal with issues and questions across time zones with the need uh, to be to have interrupted focus? So how do you balance the fact that you have to sync and deal with questions and everywhere in and in every time zones, but at the same time, um, you know, lose your focus and all you've been like disconnecting, but how, what do you do if you have to uh, kind of be available because you have other time zones? For sure. So that's a great question. We're lucky to be spread across 11 different time zones. So chances are, even though it's your weekend, even though you're asleep, somewhere, someone somewhere may be working at Buffer or on Buffer as a product. So first, I think that not all work is similar, as in 
if you work on customer support, we really need support around the clock. So it's harder to work asynchronously when you're in customer support. So it's really the theme of back and forth that comes in with taking care of your customers wherever they are. So that sort of needs to be in sync and that needs to be addressed. Uh, when it comes to thinking, when it comes to especially engineering work, for instance, or project work, what we started to do as an experiment is no meeting Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we try to schedule zero meetings mm. and we have the entire day, which is halfway through the week, which is, I find very enjoyable to just think about what you do and think about working offline, at least on your own schedule, uh, which I find very, very powerful. The other thing about uh, uninter uninterrupted focus is about tweaking your Slack notification. I find that very few people do it, but for instance, for myself, I don't get the little slider notification when someone ping me on Slack. I only get a little, um, a little number with a number of notification pending so that when I work on something, I will only see Slack messages if I go back to Slack. If it's very important, my team members have my phone numbers so they can reach out to me. So I always want to keep the door open, but I'm also mindful that chances are it's not that urgent or it can be addressed in 10, 20 or 30 minutes from now. Okay, because I mean, if one of you in that question is very often other team members will might be blocked if because they're not able to um, and have an answer from you. So this is why there's kind of this feeling of like you need to be available or, or at least have because if you're in snooze have like hard hard um, a notification on Slack. So it's, it's mostly this that is very hard to do because people, you know, are dependent of some time on, on things on your side. Uh, but we'll block them to like continue further in the task that they have to do. That's absolutely right. So, so people use, we use Trello for instance, for report cards so that even if you async at the end of your day, you let the other person know what has happened. We do send up meetings in some teams. Uh, we write a lot on Dropbox paper. We, we, we write a lot of things down just to make sure we're not holding people back. At times it happens that we have challenging meetings uh, due to time zone or that one particular person's answer is going to be slowing things down. So it works both ways. Either someone can take what you've done and work during your sleep so that when you wake up in the morning, it's all done, or you can hit a roadblock where um, you're going to be working on something and then you need to wait two days until the person is going to pick up the slack uh, on a specific project. So it can really go both ways. That's something that we need to embrace as a remote team. Uh, be, be mindful of what people do. Awesome. Let's go ahead and do another question so we can do as much as we can. Um, the next one is from Angelique and uh, her question is, are you focusing on an eight hour workday or are you encouraging on being as effective as possible, even if that means less hour or working time sp spread during the day? That's a great one. I, I would really advise towards objective base, which means maybe not doing eight hours. I, I don't think that being on set hours may, may be the, the best scenario, but just trying to get to your outcome. So I'll always try and plan my day on the night prior and then reflect on what I've done at the end of the day. So I'd really advise towards being as effective as possible. Some days I will feel great. Monday and Tuesday, usually I work a lot more than on Wednesday and Thursdays because I have more energy and usually it's just those are just better days for my like three years experience. I know I get more done on Monday and Tuesday than on the rest of the day. So I'm happy to do longer day Monday, Tuesday and shorter day afterwards. So and if I'm sick or traveling or unavailable, then it's going to shift everything because I still want to give a good experience to my team, although I may need to disconnect for any personal reason there is. So empathy is a key word and objective driven schedule is the second one. Good, good advice. Um, another one is from Soram, and the question is, what are some simple things, say a checklist of things that works, hacks, that new remote workers can do to stay productive and focused? Yes, so I think the best service you can do for yourself if you want to have shorter work days and get more done is right now to open a tab on your browser, go to Facebook and log off from Facebook. Because if you make anything, any behavior there is 20 seconds harder than it is at present time, 
you are less likely to do it. So if you connect right now and you go to Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and you disconnect from it, next time you're trying to do a 25 minute, for instance, interrupted block of work, you're much more likely to go through the entire thing without being interrupted. So to me, reducing distraction is the best service you can do to yourself without going into crazy things. Check, checklist, uh, pen and paper. So actually I have a notebook here. So physical pen and oh. paper work, I find very rewarding as well because you know where you stand. You know where you stand at all time. And it's very satisfying for people like that. Maybe it's just a thing, but taking things off. So it's out of your to-do list is very satisfying too. Cool. Thanks. And uh, how often do you disconnect? This is a question from Theo. He's asking, how often do you disconnect uh, completely, completely off from, uh, apart from your nine to nine that you were talking about? That's a great one. The answer is not often enough. As in, I go on those long sailing trips. I've been twice for a month, which is a little bit crazy, but I don't do that often because it's hard to find time. I really try to strive to go on vacation two or three times a week. Uh, today I work full time. I have my own project. I teach and I do a few other things on the side. So I don't disconnect enough for vacation. That's why I try to disconnect every day because otherwise it will push it a little bit too much. So, so someone famous somewhere say, I want a life I don't need to take vacation from. I don't think I'm at that stage just yet, but certainly going away for a week at a time, two times a week, two times a year is, is somewhat aligned with what I did today. Yeah, and I guess that if you take weekends and you completely turn off everything for at least two days, it actually feels very good already. And the fact that you can also work from anywhere you want and you can decide to be somewhere new and feel a little bit of a disconnect vacation for two days and then come back to work uh, on the Monday and then do the work. That's right, That's absolutely. Cool. Um, next question is from Rianne. How do you uh, divide your time between work and study? So basically, I guess, uh, work and learning new, new skills. That, that's absolutely great. So 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. is study time. So I will learn new things. I will acquire new knowledge because I think that's very important. And then I'll work. And when I stop, and then during lunch, usually I will try and listen to a podcast maybe. And then I'll go back in the afternoon. Oftentimes I will at the end of the day, get a, a, a TED talk in uh, before, before I end my day. So like the, the, the short answer to this is if I haven't been learning for at least one hour per day, then I feel like I haven't had a satisfying day. So I really try and find this new information and new tips and new ideas. Cool. Let's do one last question. We have two minutes to answer. Uh, and this was, was, this one was popular again from Siobhan, who's a, Really active and an active remote worker. Um, Siobhan is, gonna, is asking, uh, do you have any advice for people who used to be productive but a sudden change of life circumstances, a new baby or a house move, for example, has knocked them off, uh, off, off course? Yes, that is a great one. So whilst I haven't had this event myself as a new baby, I've certainly moved location a lot, several times over. Uh, and I think two, two, two short parts here. So the first one is, can you try and find people who've already been in your situation to find pointers from them? When I think about new baby, for instance, my friend Nicole had a baby recently and she blogged about it on Buffer's open blog, what it's like to be a mom, a new mom, and going back to work in a remote team. So finding experience from people that have done it is a very inspiring way for me to try to position myself and seeing whether it's, it's, uh, it's doable or not. And the other part of this is whichever stories and feedback you'll get to hear from people, the key word for me is just empathy, as in if you feel like you will be stressed and you'll be uneasy, and, and that's very not normal with any new situation in life there is, just affording yourself the empathy to maybe work a little bit less for a few days, for a week, and gradually go back to what you do through experiments and through understanding that as anyone else, it's very normal that you need time to get back to it uh, is very key as well. So yeah, I'll, I'll find more information online and I will have empathy toward myself 
not to overwork, especially if it's a very new situation. Hmm. Thank you so much. We are right on the timing. <laughs> it's wonderful. So uh, thank you very much again, Rodolfo, for taking the time to share your knowledge and all your tips that you acquired in the past years working remotely. And uh, I hope we'll see you again soon. For sure. See you soon. Enjoy the, the stream, guys. Bye.